Good evening, all. Uh, thank you for being part of tonight's town hall. Uh, let's start with prayer. Look with pity, O oh Heavenly Father, upon the people in this land who live with injustice, racism, terror, disease, and death as their constant companions. Have mercy upon us. Help us to eliminate our cruelty to these, our neighbors. Strengthen those who spend their lives establishing equal protection of the law and equal opportunities for all. And grant that every one of us may enjoy a fair portion of the riches of this land through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Uh, I, I'm going to open uh, very simply with a, a, a statement about the Breonna Taylor decisions yesterday. Uh, many of our uh, people in the Diocese of New Jersey are in great despair and pain, uh, as people are across the country, and especially in the Black community, people of color. I, got a, I woke up this morning to an email from one of the priests of our diocese, one of our Black priests, uh, who was in grief, anger, and despair, uh, sharing with me uh, the pain of having to have a conversation uh, with his daughter about the uh, about the, the uh, uh, inequity uh, and failure of our justice system to be fair to Black people. And I want to share with you uh, part of my response to that priest. I wrote to him, today. I can't begin to imagine your grief and rage at the reprehensible decisions that came out of Louisville yesterday evening in response to the murder of Breonna Taylor. Once again, the white American injustice system has miscarried not only for Breonna Taylor and her family, but for all black Americans. I too was outraged by yesterday's decision and grieve with you recognizing, however, that my grief and outrage still enjoy the protections of that very system of white privilege in a country and church that continues to operate within a still prevailing sense of white supremacy. My heart is also broken imagining the conversation you and so many parents of black, brown, and other children of color are having with your children and not only about this, but about the frequency, indeed regularity, with which violence is visited upon people and communities of color with impunity and little or no accountability. I am crying with you and offer myself in whatever way I can to be of support and help. Uh, we should all be grieving in this nation for the continuing patterns of injustice. And, uh, and I grieve too uh, for the two police officers that were shot yesterday uh, in the midst of the demonstrations uh, that were taking place. Uh, these events unleash uh, violence in so many. We're such a violent nation in every way. Uh, we need to ask ourselves why that is and lament of it uh, and begin to really address what's at the heart of the matter of, of the violence that so afflicts us. We're among the most violent civilized nations uh, in the world. And uh, it is not what the Prince of Peace calls us to. So uh, I just, um, uh, that's gonna be my only statement um, for tonight. Uh, I think it's important and I pray that we all will work at uh, finding uh, ways of addressing the injustices of our society uh, and uh, building beloved community and walking the way of love to which our presiding bishop calls us. Uh, Greg Wilson's with us tonight and Greg has done some really uh, important work uh, on behalf of our clergy. And so, uh, Greg, uh, would you please? Thank you, Bishop. Uh, I'm the, uh, the priest in charge at Trinity Swedesboro, but I'm also a licensed clinical social worker in private practice. And I wanted to call your attention to a reality that I'm sure many of you are aware of as, as lay leaders and congregations, but it's the reality that this is an exceptionally difficult time to be a clergy person in the church. If you think of just the, the plethora of, of different strains that our, our clergy are under, whether it be uh, the pandemic, which has, has been unprecedented in, in its uh, effects on our congregations, the divisive politics that we're experiencing right now, just the, the various stresses and, and, and experiences that we're going through as clergy. And so we have a new resource that we've put together to support your clergy, and, and I'm going to talk to you eventually, the laity as well. Um, and it's essentially a hotline. Uh, it's a joint venture between the Diocese of Newark in New Jersey, and it's a hotline uh, where clergy can call in and immediately talk to a uh, mental health, a licensed mental health practitioner who we have standing by. We're calling it a warm line because it's not around the clock. It's only going to be available 
uh, certain uh, hours and days of the week. Right now, Wednesdays from 10 to 12, and Fridays from 4 to 6. And uh, clergy will have this number available to them. They can call up. They can immediately talk to somebody who can uh, uh, support them, uh, who can uh, help guide them through um, whether it's an immediate crisis or something that's uh, stirred them up in the moment, and then lead them to therapeutic resources, to refer them to other resources. You may be familiar that uh, Church Pension Group has an employee assistance program, which is a wonderful complement to the work that we're doing here. Um, the employee assistance program will also help connect clergy uh, with therapists in their area who uh, take their insurance. Um, I think the difference to this um, is that we are able to get people immediately in contact uh, with a licensed practitioner uh, who can help them in the moment. Um, so I want to make you aware of that. Um, this is a benefit to you and to your clergy uh, going forward. Um, we will be, we anticipate, anticipate launching uh, this, uh, this warm line on October 2nd, uh, next Friday. We're, we're struggling with Google a little bit right now to get the actual phone number. Uh, you'll see in the chats, um, we have a web page which describes it. There, there's a dummy number in here. Don't call the 999 number. Um, but, but there is a dummy number in there. Um, and so that will be, as soon as we get the, the Google piece straightened out, which hopefully will be the next day or so, we'll have the real number up there and, and your clergy can call. And so I really encourage you as the lay leaders to reach out to your clergy, check in with them, make sure they're doing okay um, and that they know about this warm line resource. Um, uh, the other piece I want to share with you is that we're hoping after okay. we deploy okay. the clergy uh, to share this with uh, with the lady as well. This is something in a second phase of this. If, if it goes well, that we would extend this to the lady. So imagine how powerful that might be for your parishioners to know that the, the diocese has this resource available where they can immediately talk to somebody uh, who cares and can help them find uh, further mental health resources. Finally, just as I wrap up, but it here, was it was it turned um, down in the end. It was nine hundred and twenty-two uh, dollars for uh, new clinicians to be part of our resource database. And so, if you have a therapist, a licensed therapist who you've worked with, who's been uh, a really good resource for you, I'd be interested in hear, hearing that person's name. Uh, you can see uh, in the chat section my email. If you just want to go ahead and send me an email and 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 the contact information for that person, that that would be wonderful. Um, so that's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you so much. And uh, are there any questions? Any questions for Greg about this? <clears throat> I'm most grateful uh, to Greg for the work that he's done uh, to help us respond to the COVID-19 and other challenges, uh, and especially uh, in the area of mental health and for the mental health of our clergy. Greg, thanks so much. And, and for the work that we're, the cooperative work we're doing with the Diocese of Newark. Thank you. Thank you. And just to, if folks do have questions, you can uh, click on the participants window to uh, then hit the raise hand button, or you can put it in chat. Okay, uh, Dr. Phil Lewis on re-entering, uh, reopening, reimagining. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me see if I can uh, get my screen shared. Okay. Um, one of the major issues uh, as um, uh, parishes have been uh, reopening is to uh, make sure that, you know, that they're sending in plans, but particularly plans uh, with diagrams and measurements on them. Uh, it's critical for us to be able to understand the degree to which um, people mass and unmask will be uh, in relationship to each other. Uh, so again, uh, please uh, uh, try to make sure that those measurements are on there. Uh, you know, we of course get back with folks if they're not there and try to help work that through. Um, clearly, if you're do doing something that's uh, major and new in terms of opening, uh, we'd expect to see a plan. However, we'd expect that once uh, a parish is, is open uh, in the main, and particularly they have indoor worship, that sort of thing, uh, that there shouldn't be a need for uh, submitting new plans for 
um, a minor addition uh, to uh, to the parish's ministry, something that um, uh, you would normally do. Uh, however, uh, please know that the task force is always uh, available to uh, help answer questions and to make sure that um, uh, you know we proceed in the most uh, reasonable way. I am very glad to know that we're going to have a, a presentation from someone from the uh, Mercer County Health Department so that folks can have an idea about what contact tracing is. Um, because I know there's been a reasonable amount of um, concern about what uh, parishes are required to do. Uh, the major thing here is that uh, we really want to um, look at folks or uh, know when folks have been medically diagnosed as even either having COVID the disease or being positive for the virus itself. Um, and the response should really be a coordinated response within the parish. Uh, I'll mention again in another slide here that there should be a, a team within the parish that is working you know, with the clergy, uh, with the uh, uh, vestry uh, to ensure that there's appropriate uh, pastoral support, of course. Um, but uh, real confidentiality, um, so that information that uh, people need is provided, but that we don't name people unless they're asking to be named uh, specifically, for instance, for prayer. Uh, it is very important, of course, that uh, people be in contact with their personal physician and the local health departments. Um, <clears throat> and of course, um, it, it is, never a good idea to give medical uh, advice unless you are the personal health care provider for that person. So clearly uh, for parishes, um, that would generally not be the case. And so we'd ask you not to give medical advice. It is important, uh, as the bishop has asked, that uh, if uh, there is uh, knowledge or suspected knowledge of uh, uh, someone with COVID or someone who may have been exposed or any of that sort of thing that you contact uh, uh, Ken Phyllis Jones, obviously. And, uh, and then of course, talk with your local health department uh, to get uh, clarity about what their recommendations are. Um, I mentioned the uh, clergy and congregational response teams. Um, and uh, actions really are gonna to have to be uh, tailored to the particular circumstances. So uh, again, the task force is happy to work with you to ensure that we have the most reasonable responses. Um, the, the, it is critically important, of course, that uh, we try to make sure that uh, people have the information that they need. That's just a clear statement of the facts about time exposure, that sort of thing, and when actions are being taken uh, in a very um, you know, straightforward way. <clears throat> uh, I think the major point here really is that uh, we do wanna make sure that while parishes are keeping information, about who's in uh, our buildings, uh, that that information should really be available to the public health department as they're doing the con uh, contact tracing. Uh, the contact tracing is not something that uh, parishes should be trying to do. Uh, another few odds and ends here. Uh, the, uh, update to the guidelines um, spoke to the whole question of wind instruments and um, distances for singers. Uh, and of course, all that information is here that uh, singers without masks need and or wood, uh, wind instruments need to be at least 30 feet from uh, another individual. Uh, uh, 15 feet if they're wearing a face shield or there's a um, acrylic or plexiglass barrier. Uh, this is particularly uh, delicate to think about with regard to wind instruments, of course, because the barrier has to be uh, adjusted given which instrument that you're talking about. It's going to be different for a flute, obviously, than a trumpet or a trombone. So I'll uh, just think about that for a little bit. And of course, the whole idea of singing with the mask, uh, that's allowed within 10, 
10 feet. And, and this is keeping in mind that, that singing um, is, uh, produces more aerosols uh, at a higher force uh, and velocity than uh, normal speaking. So that's why the uh, request uh, for the extra distance. And then about coffee hour, the, uh, we did update the guidelines <clears throat> to uh, respond to the science that says um, that uh, food is not a way that uh, this virus is likely to be transmitted. That is really uh, aerosols and respiratory droplets. That said, um, it is really important to understand that coffee hour as we normally think about it is not what we're talking about here. It is critical that um, there is strict adherence to the guidelines with regard to distancing, masking, uh, ensuring that people are not congregating around food, that um, when people are seated at tables that they're at least six feet away from anyone uh, that is not within their same immunological bubble. And an immunological bubble is just basically people that you live with more or less. I mean, there, there are more nuances to that. We can discuss that. But having those distances is, is critical. It is highly important though, that you really think about, um, is this really necessary at all, given that we're entering a time of the year uh, when there's uh, almost certainly to be increased viral transmission. And so uh, managing any of these sorts of things is gonna be um, uh, much more difficult than uh, anyone would ever imagine. And so it's important to know that if you decide to do this, it's not the way we think about coffee hour normally being. Uh, it's very different and adherence to the guidelines is really important. I, I, I met with it. Sorry, let me just jump in for a minute on this. Sure. Um, yeah, thank you, Phil. Uh, I, you know, I just want to share that um, uh, I, I said to the chairs of the RRR task force that the idea of coffee hour makes me nervous. And especially at this time of year, as we're pretty sure there's gonna be an uptick in uh, COVID-19 as well as, uh, you know, as the flu. And I really want people to ask how critical it is for you to have coffee hour uh, in this context. Uh, is it worth the risks? Um, uh, I'm not gonna answer that for you, but I, but I think you should ask the question. And a part of my, and, and what I said to the chairs, and a part of my concern is, I think it's one thing when we review the plan for worship and we know there's a set order and we know what the, what the sanctuary looks like and what the seating looks like. The coffee hour, people start to get loosey-goosey and move around and talk and, and, I, you know, and if they're eating and stuff and the masks are coming down, I am very concerned about the risks of that exposure, uh, which is why um, uh, Dr. Phil is underscoring the, the fact that the strict guidelines need to be maintained. And that's necessarily gonna impact what coffee hour uh, feels uh, and looks like. So I just, um, I, I, I think virtual, so someone's posting about virtual coffee hours. I think that's a great way to go. You know, uh, Trinity Cathedral has been doing that after their worship services online of just having people stick around and have conversation and, you know, have your cup of coffee uh, ready. So uh, I just put that out there again. I'm not looking, uh, I, 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 I told the chairs, I didn't feel a need for us to withdraw the, the, um, the, the plan for, uh, coffee hour under the guidelines, but uh, just to just to say, we should really think about this one. And um, can I read a question for Phil from um, Wendy Blackman? Phil, yeah. Wendy Blackman asks: uh, Suppose the person doesn't want the diocese to be made aware because of confidentiality. I think I'm actually going to jump in on that one first. Uh, because I think, Wendy, um, the, the important thing to know is that the diocese is not looking for the names of anybody, uh, just as we don't want you to give the names to anybody else. What we simply want to know is if there has been an exposure uh, of, uh, of someone to COVID-19 and they've been diagnosed so that there is a risk to the parish uh, and the people in the parish. Um, uh, and, and that way, um, Phyllis has done her homework. She's well-versed. And that way we can uh, help you, help the congregations do the things they need to do to respond uh, to such an exposure, um, which we're going to hear about in the contract tracing, a video that we're, we're going to be doing in a moment. 
Uh, Phil, do you want to add anything to what I just said? Or Phyllis, do you want to add anything to what I just said? Oh, no, 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 I thought you were right on, right on the money there. <laughs> yep, same here, spot on. We, you know, knowing the circumstances and, but not knowing the names is just fine. And uh, Phyllis, there is a, a question. I think this is more for you from uh, Elaine Patania. If a person who found out that they tested positive for COVID and attended church on Sunday, we should contact Phyllis and then the response team from the church should contact local health department those who are at church that particular Sunday should be contacted by whom? Uh, they should be directly contacted by the local health department. Um, however, um, there is, you know, a, a notification to the congregation at large, you know, and that can include people who were at the service that particular day and weren't at the service. Um, it can, it, uh, talking about the circumstances, again, you know, just, <laughs> just to say the, the cliche, just the facts, right? But not the person's name. So the fact that there was a person at such and such service on such and such date who tested positive uh, for COVID-19 or um, was diagnosed with COVID-19 um, and that the local health department has been notified. Uh, any further notifications or contacts with individuals who may have been present at that service will be handled by the local health department. So that's basically that's and, and, and I'll add, and in that notice should also say, and if you feel symptoms or feel uh, any reason that you would like to get tested, please do so. Right. Okay. You know, and that's part of what the response team from the church can be talking about. You know, uh, how exactly how do you want that communication to go out? Um, uh, but those are just the those are the basics of what you include in it. Nothing more than that. And and I would uh, I would really urge congregations to have their response plan now mm -hmm. because it's going to happen. We've we've now already had a couple of instances. So uh, please be ready. Don't wait for it to happen before you. Um, uh, know exactly what steps you're going to take. Okay. But again, we've got a video we're about to show. I, this morning for the clergy, we had two representatives from uh, the health department, uh, Mercer County Health Department, uh, state of New Jersey. And, uh, and uh, we videotaped that. Uh, Steve videoed it. So we're going to show the video of their presentation on, con on contact tracing, which is a really helpful piece. And then on the other end of the video, we'll field whatever questions you have and uh, see if we can if we can answer them. Phil, do you have anything else that you wanted to add? Oh, no, except that um, just keep in mind that all health departments, as much as they try to be fairly uniform in the way they do things, um, will be just a little bit different, right, from one county to the other. So this video will be very helpful in giving a general idea. But um, it, it is really important to realize that uh, it's important to talk to the health departments that are concerned with the parish and perhaps another health department where the person lives, which may not be where the parish is, right? Um, and the health departments will coordinate with each other and get things straight. But, uh, but just, just, just that, sure. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, am I right that we're going to the video now? Uh, I think so. A few videos. <laughs> So let me, let me share my screen. Uh, and while I uh, get this share up, let me just also make a pitch for um, the diocese YouTube channel where this video lives, um, recorded sessions for all of our town halls are there, as well as m a lot of other content, including the Bishop's Weekly Sermon, uh, worship services, uh, and other uh, feature content. So uh, I'll put the... Um, I'll put the address of our YouTube in the um, in the chat, but then we'll just start the video. Um. So this is to educate you a bit on the contract tracing piece. All right, so. All right, so we're just gonna, we're not gonna do like a show of hands, but this is just kind of to there's some misconceptions in here and just something, something to think about. They're not all true. So um, this is the first time that New Jersey has used contact tracing to control an infectious disease. Think and to you yourself, true or false? <laughs> That's all. Quarantine and isolation are the same thing and are interchangeable terms. 
when I give a contact tracer, the names of my close contacts, they reveal my identity to that person. A contact tracer will ask for relevant information about my living situation and health, but will never ask personal financial or identifying information that would contribute to identity theft or legal action. Asymptomatic carriers of COVID-19 cannot spread the virus and therefore do not need to be tested. So think about that and here we go. So contact tracing has been around for a very long time since the 1920s. Um, it's the process used to identify those who come into contact with people who have tested positive and it's been used for many contagious diseases and it has been historically somewhat controversial because it is dealing with people's personal information, sometimes their sexual habits. So, you know, the, the, and the hostility towards the process is not new and we do have protections in place for the private data that we are collecting. Um, technology has changed. Obviously, um, New Jersey does not use these tracking apps that we're all hearing about, but we do have a pretty sophisticated system where we're getting the data quickly from the testing sites and are able to execute tracing in a very quick manner because of that. So why is it so important for this virus? Um, it's highly contagious, it's airborne. We have both asymptomatic and symptomatic carriers, and that really has no bearing on how contagious you are. Um, and there's currently no vaccine and no treatment. So um, it really, the ball is in contact tracing's court. We need to break the chain of transmission. And this is one of the, oh, what happened? Wait. You were Sorry. just briefly muted, but you're okay. Sorry now. about that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So how does it work? Um, so basically in New Jersey, when you test positive for COVID-19, um, the lab will always call you, hopefully, or your provider and tell you the results. Hopefully we're getting to you after that call. But once they get that positive, it all goes into a epidemiological surveillance system. It's the CDRSS. So all those New Jersey positive tests download into our system that we use for tracing called ComCare. So what that does is pull all the New Jersey information and distributes it by county. So for example, I'm working with the Mercer County Health Department, so I'm seeing all Mercer counties cases. Now within Mercer County, we have our own interesting little health department system where we each have individualized health departments as well. I'm a Mercer County contact tracer. I'm working with all the health departments. Um, all right. So who are the contact tracers? There's actually two sets of us. So you have your public health officers and nurses that are working in the local health departments. That would be Princeton Health Department, Ewing Health Department. Um, then, and I'm sure you've all heard about this, you know, force of contact tracers that have come in from outside. So I am one of those. Um, I am a, a social work student. I go to Rutgers. I'm getting my master's. And there was a big outreach to get contact tracers on board. There's a goal. There's like 30 per 100,000, I think, for each county. So they've really ramped up. Our, our tracing force, and we are all, mostly this first wave, are all graduate students in public health or social work, epidemiologists, social workers. Um, we're all in this field, whether we're working actively or studying to be in it. You'll hear about other states that are having like high school graduates and call centers. That's not New Jersey right now. We have a very well-educated and well-trained force. So how do you know it's a real contact tracer? So if they're calling from a health department, like the actual like nurses within the health department. And generally for any large scale tracing effort, if it is linked to a church or um, a place of worship, a workplace, you're likely gonna be contacted from the health department. Um, so it will always say Princeton Health Department, Ewing Health Department. Now, if it's one of us, we work remotely. Um, we have all sorts of privacy things. We have our ear things. We're not talking in front of people, but we use a dialer system. So what you will see on the dialer is state of New Jersey. And this is important to note because it's a little different than 
I think the governor says it'll always say the health department. Well, actually, if it's one of us, it won't. It does say state of New Jersey, and that can be a little intimidating. And so I, I do want to put it out there that there are two different caller IDs that you'll see on your phone. But if anyone ever does have any doubts about the legitimacy and you've picked up, you can always hang up and call your local health department because they know we all are on the same system. So if you say, hey, I just got a call from Julie and I don't know if she was legit, then you can always call your local health department, mention my name or the name of the person that called and they should be able to look you up and say, oh yes, they're working with us, it's good. Um, so a contact tracer will always identify themselves. We either say, especially the outside ones when we're not actually in the physical health department, we say we're calling on behalf of that health department or we say I work with the Mercer County Health Department. So there's always gonna be that. If we leave a call back, um, we're gonna leave a number. If it's, um, it's either gonna be the number of the local health department or it's gonna be a number where you can reach just these contact tracers. So we'll always, we're gonna leave a number or a call back time. And we'll always confirm your identity in the beginning of the call, just to make sure that you know that we have some information that we couldn't have otherwise. Sometimes it's just confirmation of a street house number, but it's just to kind of let you know that we're legit, but we're not going to ask you for like private um, information. It's usually just um, addresses. So we'll never ask for financial information like credit cards, bank account numbers, salary. We will not ask for immigration status, any sort of insurance information, social security number, and everything is confidential. Your personal medical information, it's private. It's only shared with those who need to know, like your healthcare provider if there's something that comes up. Um, but yeah, we're, we're not asking really invasive questions. So we're making two different kinds of calls depending on the situation. So you've either tested positive for COVID-19 or you've been identified as a close contact of someone who has. So if you've tested positive, a contact tracer is gonna call you and say we have some private health information to discuss with you. Hopefully they've already been contacted by their doctor so they're aware. They usually let um, the patient know that we'll be calling. So our first order of business is to give isolation guidelines um, based on your symptoms or if you're asymptomatic, your test date, the date you got the positive, we recommend isolation. Um, it varies depending on which, but it's usually if you're um, symptomatic, it's obviously when your symptoms improve and there's more detailed guidelines as to what that means, but I won't go into those specifics, but uh, they will walk you through that. Um, if you're asymptomatic and you got a test, it's generally 10 days from your positive test that we're asking you to isolate. Um, we will ask about your household, how many people are in your household, what's your living situation, are you in an apartment, a group home, a residential facility, single family home, um, how many people, that's important, so that we have an idea of what your household is looking like, um, any recent social gatherings you've been to, and we put it forward that, you know, we ask you to think about if you've been to any events, but then we drill down even more and say, okay, have you been in close contact with someone within six feet for more than 10 minutes? Um, and that's the contact tracing that we all hear so much about. But it's important to note that that's done. If you've tested positive, we are asking you for your close contacts. Now, a few of our questions trigger some additional support services. Like if we ask you to isolate and if you're unable to um, have a separate bathroom that you can clean after every use, we'll offer guidance in terms of how to clean it. Um, we do have a social support coordinator position that's open right now. And so that person is, and we've had someone in the role, so we do kind of have a plan of attack when we get a trigger for social support services. Um, you know, grocery shopping, picking up medications, um, communication to your employer if you're going to be out and you know we work with the local health departments and the county resources to you know trigger that support um and so when we ask you to identify those close contacts 15 or 10 i might have messed up that guidance um and so what we do is we ask you to go back two days from when you were symptomatic and give us your um, close contacts, 
or if you're asymptomatic, just we want to know two days before your positive test. And so that's that's the world of contacts that we're gathering. Important to note, if you've tested positive, we will not share your identity with your identified contacts. Though we do advise that you notify them yourself. Um, but we won't, you know, and they can try to guess and we're not going to let on that, you know, we're, we're who it is. Um, if you are a contact, meaning you've been identified as someone that was in close contact, we will call you up. We will provide quarantine guidelines and education based on your last contact with that positive case. So if you're a household um, member, you're going to be in quarantine, quarantine for quite a long time because if you are unable to completely isolate away from that case in your household, you have to be in quarantine during the period that they are in their isolation. And then for 14 days after that person gets out of their isolation in your household, we're expecting you to quarantine. So, you know, as you can imagine, this comes with <laughs> quite, quite a bit of surprise in some cases that at this long time period, particularly for households. But if you're just a contact and you were in touch with this person, like say at Sunday services, then you would go, 14 days from that point. And we have that information based on the information that the positive case has given us. As far as dates, we will ask you to confirm that just in case there was something wrong there, but we give you a date. And so one of the reasons we're so interested in maintaining the monitoring with these contacts is if you do develop symptoms during that time that are related to COVID, we assume you are a positive at that point. So the contact tracing is monitoring the contacts for symptoms during that period. So the way we do that is we set up an SMS, a text message. So we will ask you on the call if you have a cell phone number and if you agree to use that cell phone number for daily symptom monitoring. It's much easier than a phone call. Um, we can do that as well. Some people don't have cell phones. They don't like to use text. That's fine too. But um, it's a daily symptom monitoring and say, you know, do you have fever, chills, um, difficulty breathing, you say yes, and it triggers, you'll get another phone call from a case investigator, hopefully the same contact person, and they will then register your contacts under the assumption that you are now positive. Um, and let's see what else. And so same with the um, quarantine, uh, people do have issues, they have, they have their jobs, they have their lives, they can't isolate away, not isolate, they can't quarantine um, separately. So we do ask some questions just to gauge how easy or difficult this will be. And that can trigger a response for support if they need it. And a lot of times it's about letters going back to work. Some employers, when they find out you're in quarantine, they're gonna want like two negative tests for you to come back. And so, you know, we help out with that um, communication. Okay, so important to note, we do not ask contacts for their close contacts. This is not like an invasive chain where, you know, we're trying to get all these contacts. It's if you are a contact, we're just there to educate you, advise you to quarantine and monitor your symptoms. All right, so what makes our job successful? I mean, obviously low counts of the virus, but um, timely outreach. We are, our goal is 24 hours to outreach to the positive case and then upon registration of their contacts to get them commu communicate with to them within 24 hours. Um, this is the COVID-19 New Jersey dashboard. Um, the governor goes through this on his calls. And you know, our our goal is just to be, you know, like little machines here and get that turnaround going and the education. Um, also, uh, identification of clusters. I mean, you know, we ask if you're a case, we ask where you've been, if you've been, you know, visited someone, went to a party, where was it? So it's those identifications of clusters, hotspots, that's a really important part of the job as well. Um, cooperation of the public is imperative. Um, it is challenging. Um, as I said, it's an invasive process, but um, this kind of meeting and this kind of um, Education is so helpful to help us do our job better. If you can convey just, you know, 10% of what we've gone over here to your people, it's just, it makes a world of difference. Um, and this is 
that. So just, you know, kind of refresh. If you test positive, you isolate. If you're a contact, you quarantine. Um, typhoid Mary in her isolation on North Brother Island is an example of successful but extreme contact tracing. Um, a contact tracer is trained to inquire about and identify social support needs and will offer guidance and resources based on those needs. But to that point, the most challenging populations that we are, are that need the support are the ones that aren't picking up the phone. So it's really important just to, you know, it, it's, it's awful. I mean, you know, the, the, the communities that, that are being affected are, you know, underserved and, it, this process can be a trigger to support, but that initial call has to be answered. And, you know, the numbers have to be given. We're finding a lot. They're just, you know, they'll give us the name, but they refuse to give us a cell phone number and there's not much we can do. So, um, you know, I, I beg you to, if you can convey this, you know, there's just the importance of just picking up the phone. Um, because, you know, we're, we're just, we're in, it's in the interest of public health. It's not political. It's, it's nothing but public health. Um, so that's it. I am pretty much done. I've just put a few links and I can't see them because I have my screens blocked. But um, so there's a, in the COVID site, there's a community organization um, link and it's got some interesting things for like safe facilities and whatnot and also there's a new um, school assistance program for people and you know this is all on the New Jersey website but it's some good stuff to know if you want to share it um, there's a child care credit when your kids are working remotely and you have to work that it'll um, help you out with some money which I thought was great so I want to thank you I hope this was um, helpful and uh, I'm all set you did that's great. I really appreciate your presentation. I think it was really helpful. Uh, and thank you both for being with us. I, I do understand you have to go. Um, Stephanie, was there anything else that you wanted to add on top of that? If you have any questions uh, for us, because I know last time you did, if you just email them to me, we'll get back to you. Um, unfortunately, like I said, we really do need to get off the call. We have um, something that we need to handle. Mm -hmm. So I don't mean to cut you guys off but <laughs> no we're really you know grateful we're really grateful for your presence with us this morning thank you so much for making the time um, for us the one most common question we always get is are these slides available or or not so much I'm sorry that we cannot share these slides because these are Mercer County <laughs> slides specific they're not for the state of New Jersey Great. so um, we don't want to step on any toes from the state. Got it. Understood. Thank okay. you. I do think there are some really good links um, on the COVID-19 that I can send. I can try to copy paste that right into the chat. If you want to take a look, I do believe there's some presentations that you can actually use that are quite similar. So that would be fantastic. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you both very much. Thank you both. Have a good day. Okay, um, Phil, I think you've got something you want to comment on on the, on the video. Oh, well, I, it's Steve asked me about the uh, contact time. Um, if you are within six feet of someone without a mask, um, that there was a discrepancy between a 10 and 15 minute um, figure there between what was on the slide and what was, uh, what was said. <clears throat> Best to keep in mind that um, it's not a clear cutoff, right? Um, uh, that most super spreader activities um, have been when people are unmasked and speaking in normal conversational way uh, for normal conversational time, which could easily be two, three, four, or five minutes, right? There's no question that the longer that you're speaking with someone without a mask and closer than six feet, the probability of being able to transmit the virus goes up substantially. So the best way to think about it is uh, try to minimize the degree to which you are speaking with someone without a mask and closer than six feet, unless they happen to be in your same immunological bubble. That is people who you live with or who uh, you have had enough contact over enough period of time to 
know that you have reasonably the same um, uh, exposure to the virus. Thank you, sir. Okay. Let's, uh, let's open up to questions at this stage uh, for, you know, you know what, let me, let me go ahead and just finish everything off on the agenda and then open to questions because then we can just take it as long as it needs to go. So um, uh, Mary to Story, may I ask you if there are any updates from learnings and breakthroughs? Uh, nothing new from our last uh, session. A clergy has asked for a longer return time in order to include more people in the congregation. And we're still working on turning this into an online form and getting the cover materials together to go out, which hopefully will be sometime in October. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. Phyllis? Yeah, thank you very much. I don't have much either. Um, uh, really just kind of a, um, a building on uh, some of the, the information from the Triple R Task Force. One other uh, question that we had uh, that came up last week um, is uh, for some of you who have uh, tenants uh, in your uh, buildings who, you know, you may have submitted a plan for um, and who are long-term tenants, so they have leases longer than a year, uh, which means that uh, the standing committee had to approve those leases in the first place. Um, the guidelines from the Triple R Task Force um, uh, include uh, uh, one guideline that says if there are, when there are um, the plans that are submitted by your tenants um, for being, uh, for coming back into your facilities uh, that are also reviewed, you know, uh, by the task force and, um, uh, you know, have special, you know, things that they agree to do that those, those requirements, those guidelines that they are required to abide by should become a part of their lease document whether it's an appendix or however, you know, you decide to do that. Um, but um, when you do that, when you uh, incorporate them into the lease documents, um, they do not have to have the approval of the standing committee uh, because of the term of the lease. So even though you're actually, as long as the, you know, your amendment or your addendum uh, or whatever it may happen to be, is solely related to um, the changes that need to be made to adhere to the guidelines um, for um, protection against, you know, uh, transmission of COVID-19. So as, as long as that's all it's related to, even if it's a long-term lease and you're making a change to it, it does not require the approval of the standing committee. Standing committee actually uh, decided on that last week. So just wanted to let you know. Okay, um, and Phil, we, uh, sorry, Steve, would you please, um, what do I do here, sorry. Um, Steve, would you please um, uh, talk about um, Souls for the Harvest? I will, uh, and uh, I'm gonna share something on my screen. While I do that, there, is a, there, is, a, there is a question for Phil from Henry Richards. Uh, do you have any differences in recommendations between a usual outside worship vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the blessing of animals? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, th the major thing is that um, for God knows what reason, literally, <laughs> um, dogs and cats in particular seem to be able to transmit the virus fairly readily. So um, the major issue there is that uh, clergy who are involved in blessing animals really need to be wearing gloves uh, and sanitizing uh, between animals. But uh, that, that, that's the major, major difference. Okay, great, thanks. And uh, so the bishop asked me to say a, a word or two about Souls for the Harvest. If you're not familiar with it, it's a, it's a 5K and one, one mile fun run that we do every year here in the diocese to raise money, particularly for, for Jubilee Ministries, but also for really any, um, you get to choose what charity you raise money for. This year, it's virtual in the sense that uh, you you will run your your part of the quote unquote race locally. You can do it in your neighborhood. You can do it on a treadmill, however you want. Uh, and the time period for it is running for a full week from November one to seven. The catch is you have to run your entire piece in a single day. So the the same day you start it, you 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 have to finish it. Um, there's a, you can see the, uh, I'll put this link in the chat, but this is the sign up link. Um, and, um, 
there's also a printable registration form. Um, this was, by the way, in, in Good News in the Garden State this past week, and it will be this week as well. Um, but it's a really great uh, way to get a little bit of uh, 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 low impact exercise uh, and raise money for uh, uh, charities feeding and housing the, uh, the people in need in our very own community. So uh, I, I do encourage everybody to be part of that. I, I, I can. I just can't uh, support this enough. I'm grateful to Clara Gregory, our Jubilee officer. And, uh, uh, you know, this is a great way to raise money for local concerns, but for us to record it uh, because it's part of our whole diocesan community. So um, uh, please do this. Uh, you know, all of our ministries are suffering some uh, economic impact from COVID-19, some more, some less, but this is, a, this is an opportunity to, to go ahead and um, uh, plug some of that gap. So I just recommend this uh, to you. Uh, I saw from Patricia Meyer that they're, uh, for Blessing of the Animals, they've asked people to submit pictures. And um, uh, Susan, my wife, said to me, the National Cathedral is doing the same thing. So uh, that might be a way for folks to, to do that as well. Um, so let's go ahead and open it up. There's um, a question in chat from Pat McCullough, who's asking if there's been any discussion on baptism. Yeah, uh, there actually are guidelines for baptism. Uh, we are, uh, baptisms may go forward following the guidelines that uh, are on the on the website. Why does that uh, keep happening? Okay. Um, so uh, please go ahead and refer to those and refer your priest to those. I'm doing confirmations, in fact. Uh, I've done now uh, confirmations two weeks in a row. Uh, Bishop, if I could, uh, I want to mention to folks that um, those guidelines include everyone who's being involved understanding that um, the baptism, confirmation, those sorts of things require a greater contact <laughs> than would, we would normally um, uh, expect. So, but there's some risk, right? Yes, yes. So everyone just needs to be very clear, read through the guidelines, understand it, talk through with your uh, clergy people to understand uh, exactly what all that means. Yeah, just to, to share with folks what I've been doing at the confirmations is the confirmands uh, come stand in front of me one at a time. I stay masked the whole time, uh, but I only, I, I mean, confirmation is laying on hand, so I have to do that. I tell them that I'm washing my hands before each person, before and after each person. And uh, when they come up to me, uh, I am turning my head and I'm saying a short prayer of confirmation and then having them go back. So there's a minimal amount of time in front of me and uh, they're masked and I'm masked. And, uh, you know, that's, there's some risk there, but, but I think we're being as prudent as we can be and still doing what, uh, what we are supposed to do. And, and, and to help people with that a little bit, um, th there is no recorded incident of anyone getting a disease from confirmation or from baptism. So um, the guidelines and, and the bishop has been uh, very uh, good about um, you know, paying attention to all of these things. And they are really quite uh, protective. But uh, again, there's, there's been no incident of that over the whole history of the church, uh, much less uh, from this pandemic. Great. Um, so I, I, I see, uh, again, Jonathan uh, Gloucester is asking a question. Are there any guidelines for those who come in contact with someone who is symptomatic but has not received test results back? You know, the, the short answer to that question is that they should be prudent and probably uh, avoid contact with others until they're either tested or uh, exhibit symptoms themselves. But we uh, are not taking action except for confirmed COVID-19 contacts and uh, uh, results, as far as I understand. Phil, you, or Phil, either one of you want to add to that? No, no, that's quite right. Uh, the only thing I would add is just it, it would be important to talk with your personal physician and or the health department, uh, and they'll help walk you through exactly what to do. But, um, you know, the, the parish itself uh, should not be responding in, ex in that kind of case. Right. And the one thing that we did, you know, discuss this morning, too, um, which is important, you know, is, is that we don't want to get the rumor mill started, um, you know, which is why we only deal with either positive tests or medically diagnosed cases. 
Um, if we have instances like this where there's kind of a gray area, um, then, you know, we, uh, again, there are, there are common sense things, you know, that that, that, that person can do. Um, as Phil mentioned, you know, uh, to, you know, can consult their own personal physician um, and, you know, make sure to stay you know, distant from other people um, until you find out more, until you have information that says more about what you really should be doing next. So, um, so that's pretty much where that's at. Yeah, and it really speaks again to the importance of the parish having a response team, right? Mm -hmm. And people in the parish knowing who the team is. Uh, so that, um, because again, it's easy enough for that response team to be in contact with Phyllis and or the task force and we can help, you know, walk things through because uh, inevitably these are all going to be very individualistic <laughs> situations and, mm -hmm. uh, and they may not be easy to generalize. Uh, so it's all facts and circumstances. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> Mary Duke is asking if we notify the congregation that someone tested positive, surely they will ask what they should do next. And I think, Phil, you already covered this, but why don't you reiterate what you said before? She's asking, how should we respond? Yeah, well, um, the really, uh, it, it's one, make sure the person has talked with their personal physician and the public health department so that they know exactly what to do. And then uh, the information should be handled by the response team from the parish to figure out how to best get information to um, the people in the parish in a way that's uh, properly um, uh, confidential around uh, you know, the information of the person that they've received it about. And I think Mary, um, just to, I, I think what I'm hearing in the question is that, um, you know, the, the parish is gonna be told that they should uh, pay attention to themselves, each person. Uh, and, and whether that they that they've had a potential exposure, and that uh, they may want to go get tested, that's up to them, uh, or uh, they should watch for uh, exhibiting symptoms of them of, of themselves. Be pay attention to that. Um, I, I think that's it, right, Phil? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And, and that's where the the importance of each individual talking with their personal physician, because it's really going to be dependent a lot on what the uh, medical information is for that person about what they need to do. Right. And I mean, there is, there is also, you know, the likelihood that they are going, that those who, who may have actually been in the same space as, so in other words, if you're notifying the entire congregation, but there are only maybe a certain few that were in the same space, like an in-person worship service with the person who tested positive, those people who were in the same space, um, can expect to be notified by the local health department because that will be part of the contact tracing. Right. Uh, Jerry Ann Breck is asking, parishes that have had an exposure, um, or if a parish does have an exposure, aside from the contract tracing contact tracing notification, did the celebrant have to quarantine? So let's leave that in the hypothetical. If this occurs, will the celebrant have to quarantine and potentially no on-site services for two weeks? My understanding would be yes. If there's, if there's an affirmative, uh, a positive COVID-19 exposure uh, in a worship service uh, that the celebrant was likely exposed, that they should, that, that they probably should suspend for two weeks, right? Yes, yes, yes. Um, and, and in fact, it's, it's the part of the reason that along with the fact that we're entering, uh, you know, winter, uh, and fall, and that uh, we're going to be inside more, that we tried to let everyone know that as open as we're trying to be with regard to services and that sort of thing, that it's always possible that for a lot of reasons, we may have to go back to virtual services and that sort of thing. Uh, but that yes, that's certainly a case in which that would be required. Right. Uh, Robin Hust is writing, I thought the notification was supposed to come from the health department of the church. Uh, Robin, uh, my, my understanding of our procedure is that the church should notify the congregation that they've been told there's a COVID-19 exposure mm -hmm. and positive, and that they should expect to be contacted by the health department if additional steps need to be taken. Phil, have I got that right? Yes, no, that's right. Right, and I guess my response to that would be that it actually, in you know, depending on the circumstances, comes from both 
right. you know, because but, it's, it's right. going to be a, a notification to the congregation um, about the circum the incident that happened with no specific names attached to it. Um, but then for the people who were in contact with the person who tested positive, then that notification, those notifications, that contact tracing will come from the health department. Right. And then Lou Cavalier was asking, but if the celebrant was exposed outside of the parish and that priest gets tested, do they need to quarantine for two weeks? Uh, probably. Um, and uh, again, it, it's very dependent on a lot of other factors, but uh, more than likely the answer would be yes. But if the priest gets tested and the test results come back within two days and he's negative or she's negative. Yeah, again, that's one of those things where it's tough to answer in the general, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, frankly, in most it cases... negatives, right? Well, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so usually what will happen, and, and, and that's why I was saying it really depends on the personal physician and the health department working together. Because generally what's going to happen is that uh, there's going to need to be two tests in a row separated by about three or four days that are both negative. Um, and again, it really depends on the other information about health status of the person concerned and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it can be shortened for a lot of reasons, but you know, my inclination yeah. as Bishop is to say to clergy, if you've been exposed, we want to be very conservative because the yeah. potential for you to infect other people is too high. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and it's easy enough, again, working with the personal physician and the health department to figure out the particulars. And certainly, you know, we, we've worked with you know, several clergy along the way to help figure those sorts of things out. So um, it's it, it yeah. can be done. Yeah. yeah. But but it's best to plan on needing to quarantine for the two weeks. Yeah. And I think Dr. Henry Richards has said two tests, the negative tests in succession. I think that's right, too. So. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 basically right. But it, it's usually separated by several days, and it's going to depend a lot on the individual's uh, health status about how long that has to be. Right. Uh, Gene Hamilton, if we're following guidelines at church, we should never be within six feet of people or unmasked for ten or fifteen minutes. I think that's right. <clears throat> that's true. <laughs> right. 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 And then Fran Moore was asking, what if the celebrant has antibodies? I think our advice is still the same. Um, yeah, see, that's where, again, there, there needs to be uh, a personal physician, an epidemiologist, an infectious disease person, a public health person trying to figure that out. Because the current research on what antibodies mean right now are sort of changing day to day. And it sort of depends in part, where do they get the antibodies, right? Um, um, what sort of exposure did they have? Uh, were they exposed to a highly infective case or were, was it an asymptomatic exposure? So there are a lot of things that go into that. Um, it's tough to make any general statement about antibodies right now. Um, and it really has to be very individualized. All right, friends, so we're at that hour, I think. Um, unless there's anything critical someone's got to ask or say. I don't see anything more in the chat. All righty, let's go to Compline. The Lord Almighty grant us a peaceful night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. The maker of heaven and earth. Let us confess our sins to God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all our offenses, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. May the Almighty God grant us forgiveness of all our sins and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. Psalm 31. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. 
Incline your ear to me, make haste to deliver me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe, for you are my crag and my stronghold. For the sake of your name, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that they have secretly set for me, for you are my tower of strength. Into your hands I commend my spirit, for you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Thanks be to God. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. Keep us, O Lord, as the apple of your eye. Hide us under the shadow of your wings. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, hear our prayer. And let our cry come to you. Let us pray. Be present, O merciful God, and protect us through the hours of this night, so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of this life may rest in your eternal changelessness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Litany during the coronavirus pandemic. Jesus Christ, you traveled through towns and villages curing every disease and illness. At your command, the sick were made well. Come to our aid now in the midst of the global spread of the coronavirus that we may experience your healing love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heal those who are sick with the virus. May they regain their strength and health through quality medical care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heal us from our fear, which prevents nations from working together and neighbors from helping one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heal us from our pride, which can make us claim invulnerability to a disease that knows no borders. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus Christ, healer of all, stay by our side in this time of uncertainty and sorrow. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be with those who have died from the virus. May they be at rest with you in your eternal peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be with the families of those who are sick or have died as they worry and grieve. Defend them from illness and despair. May they know your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be with the doctors, nurses, researchers, and all medical professionals who seek to heal and help those affected, as well as those who perform essential services to sustain our common life and who put themselves at risk in the process. Be with those who through injustice have been wantonly exposed to this disease. May they all know your protection and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with the leaders of all nations. Give them the foresight to act with charity and true concern for the well-being of the people they are meant to serve. Give them the wisdom to invest in long-term solutions that will help prepare for or prevent future outbreaks. May they know your peace as they work together to achieve it on earth. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Whether we are at home or abroad, surrounded by many people suffering from this illness or only a few, Jesus Christ, stay with us as we endure and mourn, persist and prepare. In place of our anxiety, give us your peace. Jesus Christ, heal us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. A prayer for the oppressed. Look with pity, O Heavenly Father, upon the people in this land who live with injustice, racism, terror, disease, and death as their constant companions. Have mercy upon us. Help us to eliminate our cruelty to these our neighbors. Strengthen those who spend their lives establishing equal protection of the law and equal opportunities for all. 
and grant that every one of us may enjoy a fair portion of the riches of this land through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to bring to the forefront of your consciousness those for whom you're praying, the things for which you're praying. Uh, we should all be praying for this nation in a time of immense discord, of despair and anger and polarization. We pray for healing for our nation and especially for an end to the violence that so mars our common life. Pray for the family of Brianna Taylor and their grief and for all her family and friends, for the people of Louisville. Continue to pray for the healing of the officers who were wounded last night, and for the safety of all who demonstrate and those who serve and protect the common good. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ. Give rest to the weary. Bless the dying. Soothe the suffering. Pity the afflicted. Shield the joyous and all for your love's sake. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Lord, you now have set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised. For these eyes of mine have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all the world to see, a light to enlighten the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ and asleep we may rest in peace. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The almighty and merciful Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, uh, Dr. Phil Lewis, um, especially tonight, and Steve always. Phyllis, thank you. Blessings all. Uh, see you in a couple of weeks.